Good morning, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, in this video, we're going to start a series of three videos, which is going to look at the Axis powers advancing and conquering territory and expanding their empires to begin World War II. Uh, in the last video, of course, we looked at the policy of appeasement and how appeasement led to their needing to be a war because, of course, uh, the League of Nations in particular started giving Hitler everything that he wanted. He unified together the new German Reich. And by the time we get to the, the summer of 1939, Hitler's got almost everything that he wants, but he knows that the last thing that he's going to need to take is going to be Poland. And so that takes us then to August 31st, 1939, and to the radio tower that we're looking at on this particular slide. On August 31st, 1939, we get an event which is referred to as the Gliwice Incident, which is right on the border between Poland and Germany. Now, of course, the German army had been getting ready right on the border between Poland and Germany for the invasion that they knew was coming. The Polish army knew that it was coming, too, because they could see and they could hear the German army on the other side of the border. So the, the, the Polish army was sitting on the border, too. Both armies were sitting on the border waiting for orders from their respective headquarters to start, actually, the war. On August 31st of 1939, a group of SS troopers, right, so Schutzstaffel, so, so Hitler's private army, his own secret police, um, they put on uh, uniforms to appear as though they were Polish so soldiers. They jumped over the border, took control of the radio tower at Gliwice, which was a Polish radio tower, and they started to issue orders to the Polish army to begin the invasion of Germany. Now, that was a very strange thing for the Polish army because, of course, the Polish army knew that they weren't there to invade Germany, and so everybody kind of looked around in the Polish army and said, what are they talking about? Hitler, of course, had this recorded over the radio, and in the morning he got onto the radio in, in Germany and he told the German people, the Polish army was on the border, they started to attack us, and we have been returning fire and defending the Reich since about 4 o'clock in the morning on September 1st. So this is what we call a false flag operation. German agents went to Poland, used one of their radio towers to issue fake orders to the Polish army to attack Germany, so that Hitler had an excuse to say, I was fighting a defensive war. On September 1st, the German Wehrmacht staged an all-out invasion of the country of Poland. So you can see there from East Prussia and from the main part of Germany, they start what are called pincer maneuvers, which means that you surround your enemy and you, you engulf them into your military forces and ultimately force them to surrender. On September 17th, the Soviet Union also invaded Poland from the east. Now, when this happens, of course, people in the west really started to panic because when the German army and the Soviet army didn't fight each other, they realized that they were basically working in cahoots with each other. And that really scared a lot of people. On September the 3rd, France and the United Kingdom declared war on Germany. And... Ultimately, what we see is that by October 6th, 1939, the city of Warsaw, which is the capital of Poland, fell. And ultimately, what we get is the Polish resistance movements. So here we see two generals. We see the, the Soviet general on the right and Heinz Guderian, uh, the, the German uh, general there in the middle, they start holding parades together after they invade Poland. Hitler eventually goes to Warsaw and reviews the troops and makes sure that everything is you know, running well and the Fuhrer is there to oversee this invasion of Poland. Now, another important element, which we're, which we're going to start getting into more later when we talk specifically about the Holocaust, is there's a special unit of the German army, which is called Einsatzgruppen, which means a group of men who only really have one purpose. Einsatzgruppen's one purpose is they're going to find anybody who might be a leader of the resistance movement. So if you are an educated person, if you are an elected public official, if you're a 
fire chief, if you're a police chief, if you're a professor or a lawyer or a doctor or a high school principal or anybody who could assume a position of leadership, we refer to those people as the literati. The literati were concerning to the Germans because they said these people are going to be the ones to lead a resistance movement. So the German state police, the, the German secret police, kind of like the German FBI, was called the Gestapo. And the Gestapo had actually been in Poland and a lot of other countries making lists of names of people who they thought could potentially lead a resistance movement, and they handed those lists over to Einsatzgruppen after the invasion so that Einsatzgruppen could begin the process of eliminating these potential leaders of a resistance movement. And when we get Einsatzgruppen starting to function in 1939, basically you can see what's going on here, which is executions. They round these people up, they've got their names, they've got their addresses and their positions, they round them up, they take them to the middle of town, and they publicly execute them. This particular photograph is from the German Federal Archive. Um, this is a group of Polish civilians in the city of Kornik uh, in 1939. But of course, this process is going to massively accelerate, and we're going to see people all over in occupied territory being executed all the way up to through 1942, 43, 44, even into 1945, this Einsatzgruppen really begins the process of, of eliminating anybody who could have been resisting the German occupation. And this operation is called Operation Tannenberg. The thing that's going to save Germany in World War I is supposed to be the thing that's going to save them in World War II by eliminating the leaders of the resistance before they really even get a chance to start a resistance. Now, there is going to be a Polish resistance. The, the Polish government is going to go into exile, and they're going to keep trying to function from London. But ultimately, the resistance will still be there in Poland, trying to stop the Nazis through sabotage and executions of high-ranking officials and things like that. Now, what's really important is, at the same time that the, the invasion of Poland happens, Stalin also decides that he's going to expand his war into another location, and what he does is he begins the invasion of Finland. When he invades uh, Finland in the winter of 1939, this is what we refer to as the Winter War, which is going to last really from the winter of 1939 all the way up until March of 1940. And it's absolutely brutal fighting. The, the Finns put up an incredible resistance. They're just completely overwhelmed by the Russians and, and by the Soviets. Uh, but, but realistically, if you think about how this is unfolding, we see Germany and the Soviet Union invade Poland. We see Stalin and the Soviet Union invade Finland. Some people looked at this and said, Stalin and Hitler are in cahoots with each other, they're working together, and, and ultimately this is really, really bad because fascism and communism are now allies, and so we've got a really bad position on our hands. Uh, the United Kingdom, in, in the United Kingdom, Winston Churchill, of course, looks at this and says, Stalin and Hitler are basically the same guy, they're on the same team, and so we should treat them as allies of each other. When we look at the map and we think about this, then Hitler's kind of continuing the counterclockwise movements that we saw in the lead up to World War II. Uh, he's gone around the borders of Germany, right? And now we've seen Poland in the east. Now the Soviet Union's attacking Finland. Hitler's only got a couple places left to go. Of course, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact with the Soviet Union prevented him from going into Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. He took the part of Poland that he was able to acquire, and now he can basically go north or he can go west. The next phase of the operation of the Axis invading the remaining parts of Europe was the northern campaign against the two countries of Denmark and Norway. And this was going to allow Hitler to prevent a, a British naval blockade of Germany the way that they experienced it in World War I. So in April of 1940, a couple of things happen at basically the same time. In the capital city of Denmark, which is called Copenhagen, you can see it right there on the map in the little island, 
in the, the, the strait there, uh, a German merchant ship parked in the harbor at the dock and kind of waited. In April of 1940, German soldiers started pouring out of that ship, charging up to the capital, and, the, and basically seizing control of the government buildings in the capital city of Copenhagen. Denmark was forced to surrender after this sneak attack after only a few hours. And once Germany controls Denmark, because Denmark is forced to surrender, they start using Denmark as a launching point to begin the parachute and naval invasion of the country of Norway. Norway, again, puts up a really good solid fight. The problem is they're not prepared, and the German army is very modern and very sophisticated and very advanced. And after only two months, Norway is forced to surrender. In the United Kingdom, a new election replaces the former Prime Minister, Neville, Neville Chamberlain, the guy who uh, talked about how we've achieved peace in our time, and he was ultimately replaced by Winston Churchill, the guy who's been talking about, you know, be careful of Adolf Hitler. He's been talking about that really since 1936. Now all of a sudden everybody realizes, oh my gosh, Chamberlain's been right, I'm sorry, Winston Churchill's been right this whole time and we're way behind the power curve and we better get moving because there's going to be a really big war and it's going to be really, really destructive. So that's how uh, World War II actually begins. In the next video, we're going to talk about the uh, German invasion of France in April of 1940, and then we'll continue all the way on through the Axis gaining the most territory that they've ever gained in the third video on the opening of World War I. I hope everybody's enjoying the videos. I hope you're staying healthy. I hope you're staying safe. Give it a like. Make sure you subscribe to get the updates on all the newest lessons coming out as we move through this uh, absence from school, and make sure you let me know if you have any questions or comments. I will see you in the next video.